Hey friends, welcome back to Minute Rockets. It's been a little while. I don't know about you, but things have been a little crazy around here, but I'm super excited to get back to making videos. Today we're going to continue our KNSB rocket motor build, and we'll be casting the, the propellant grains, which are the red parts in this illustration. So let's get into it. We'll start by preheating our skillet to 250 degrees Fahrenheit, and here I want to mention a couple of notes about safety before we move on any further. Uh, you might have seen recently in the news some incidents where people have started a fire making propellant similar to this um, and one of the ways we can prevent that is what we're doing here is we're using a skillet with a controllable temperature and an integrated heating element. A deep fryer will work as well as long as you can set the temperature and there's no exposed heating elements. Something like this fry daddy doesn't work as well because you can't set the temperature and usually the preset temperatures are too high for what we want for propellant. If you're trying to cook propellant on a stove, even if it's an electric stove, and if any of the propellant drips down onto that element, that's going to be hot enough to ignite the propellant and you're going to have a fire. So please, if you're going to try to make your own propellant, get it, get in with a local club, find a mentor, and learn how you can do it safely and with the proper certifications. And don't ever try to cook this kind of propellant on a stove. So with that out of the way, the next thing we're going to do is calculate the amount of each of our components that we need for our propellant. So we take the percentages we want and the total weight that we want of propellant. In this case, we're going to make 300 grams of propellant. That'll be a little extra to make our four grains. And so based on 300 grams of propellant and the percentages of the KNO3 and sorbitol, and in this case, we're going to put in 1% iron oxide. So we just take the total amount of propellant we want and multiply it by the percentages and we get our total amount for each of our components and that's what we'll put in our mix. Now that we know how much of each component we want in our mix we can start to weigh, weigh things out. We'll start with the potassium nitrate. This will be the oxidizer for the propellant. I usually like to run it through a spice grinder just to break up any clumps and get it a little finer. Just a few pulses should do it. Then we'll pour it into a cup on an accurate scale until we have the desired amount. This scale I have was inexpensive and it is accurate to a tenth of a gram, so it works really well for this. I'll put a link to this scale and several of the other things I use for this in the description. Once we have our KNO3 weighed out, we'll pour it into a larger container or we'll mix it with a sorbitol and the iron oxide. I just use an old peanut container and that works really well. So now we'll weigh out the sorbitol on the same scale. It doesn't need to be ground up since it'll be melted. Particle size, clumps don't really matter since it's all going to melt anyway. One thing to note from a safety aspect is that you never want to put fuel into the same spice grinder you use for oxygen. So if you do decide to grind up your sorbitol for whatever reason, do not use the same grinder as you used for the KNO3. Otherwise, that could start a fire because you're mixing oxidizer and fuel and the spice grinder can generate heat. So don't do that. If you do need to grind it up, get a second grinder, mark them with a sharpie or something. Make sure you never mix them up. Oxidizer in one, fuel in another. Um, that goes for any kind of fuel oxidizer combination, not just sorbitol and KNO3. So once we have the sorbitol weighed out, we'll weigh out the iron oxide. For this, I just tear the scale with the sorbitol still on it and put the iron oxide right on top of the sorbitol. Um, it's such a small amount, it doesn't really make sense to get a new cup out. And there's a couple of reasons I like to put iron oxide in here. So it speeds up the reaction a little bit. And since I'm using hardware designed for APCP, which is a faster reaction than the sorbitol, then I like to speed it up just a little bit since I'm using the same throat sizes as you would use with APCP. The other reason that I like it is the color. I like to have a little bit of color in there so that I can know when it's well mixed. The iron oxide will definitely show you if your components aren't mixed together well enough you'll have streaks of red instead of a good uniform color so it works as a marker as well for that so a couple reasons I like to put the iron oxide in there so once we have everything weighed out and in our container we'll just put the lid on and shake it up so with most fuel oxidizer combinations you would never want to mix them dry like this especially shake them up in a plastic container but with um, this sugar fuel and the KNO3 they both have a pretty high barrier to ignition. The KNO3 has to be broken down to release its oxygen and the sugar has to melt and eventually vaporize before it can burn. So it's pretty safe to mix these dry. You would never want to mix the dry components of an ammonium perchlorate pr propellant like this, but with this combination of fuel and oxidizer, it's pretty safe to mix them dry. Um, they're not going to go off with just a spark or something. It's actually fairly difficult to light the the dry ingredients just mixed together like this. The same goes for our propellant once it's cured. It'll be relatively insensitive and fairly difficult to light. So that's a good thing for this propellant. We don't want it to, you know, just go up when it's in storage or with a spark. We want it to be pretty hard to light. So once it's well mixed and we have our skillet preheated, we'll go ahead and pour our propellant into the preheated skillet so it can start to melt. 
I'm gonna try to spread it out pretty evenly on the skillet so it can evenly heat up and start distributing the heat throughout the propellant. So once you get it poured in, then it'll start to melt. And as it's melting, we'll just wanna watch it. And as the propellant starts to melt all the way through to the surface in spots, we'll wanna stir it so that we keep the melted parts mixed in and that'll help it melt quicker and distribute the heat more evenly. So I talked about how when the propellant was dry, it was pretty insensitive to being lit. That's not the case as it starts to melt. As the propellant starts to melt, it becomes quite a bit more flammable. So you really need to worry about ignition sources as it starts to melt. And that's why we said earlier, you don't want to do this on a stove or any sort of a heating element or especially a flame. You want to keep any ignition sources away from the propellant as it starts to melt. And I'll link a video that someone else made about the difference between lighting dry and melted propellant in the description so you can see the difference. Now might be a good time to mention why we're using sorbitol instead of table sugar. Um, it is possible to make similar motors with table sugar, which is easier to come across than sorbitol, but it has some drawbacks. The main ones being with table sugar, if you've ever made candies or caramels, you would know as soon as it melts, it starts to caramelize and turns brown and it can start to burn. Sorbitol, as it melts, it doesn't do that. It doesn't start to caramelize immediately and it's much more forgiving as far as it melting and not degrading as it melts. And so we use sorbitol because it's safer and it's more stable. It's not going to burn and it's going to keep its properties better in the melted form. And because of those differences, table sugar and other forms of sugar are not allowed in motors under the Tripoli Research Association, which is the certification under which I'm making these motors, um, but sorbitol is allowed. Now once we see that all the propellant is melted, we'll start checking its temperature with an infrared thermometer until we get up to our desired casting temperature which again is about 250 degrees Fahrenheit. Now while we're waiting for that to come up to temperature, we can go ahead and start getting our casting supplies ready. So these are some 3D printed bases that I printed on an SLA resin printer. And they're flat on the bottom and they have a hole in the middle where we can put our coring rod and then they have a lip on the sides. And those will hold our casting tubes that will hold the propellant and they'll also hold our coring rods. And I like to coat everything in a little bit of PTFE lubricant or Teflon, and that just allows everything to release really easily. So it just uses a simple release agent, and then I just coat the bottom of those with that. Now these are the coring rods we're gonna use. These are what's gonna make the hole in the middle of our propellant. So to do that, I slide a piece of silicone tubing over a shoulder bolt. That's the correct length. The diameter of the bolt doesn't matter. The outside diameter of the silicone matters. So there's different diameters of silicone that you can purchase with different inside and outside diameters. So so you just want to purchase a tubing that has the same inside diameter as your shoulder bolt and the same outside diameter of the core you want. In this case, our core is a half an inch and the shoulder bolt is a quarter of an inch. So keep checking the propellant and checking the temperature. And I did have to turn it up just a little bit and kept stirring it while I was getting the casting tubes ready. Speaking of casting tubes, here is our casting tube. This is sort of a little cup that's going to hold our propellant and it's going to become the outside of our propellant grain. The propellant's going to stick to it and it's going to be permanently bonded to our propellant. Typically, casting tubes are made out of cardboard and they come with liners that you buy. Commercial liners usually come with casting tubes already made. These casting tubes I have 3D printed with my SLA printer and you can see if you look closely there's a line that I printed into the casting tube near the top and that is the fill line so I calculated based on the core size and the volume of propellant that will be in the grain how high I needed to fill it so that when I put the core in it would push the propellant up and fill the grain so that's what that line is and I'll make another video on how to do that calculation because this one's already getting pretty long and if you don't have the benefit of using 3d printed casting tube you can just mark a line with an ink pen or a marker inside the paper casting tubes and that'll work just as well so we'll just take our casting tube and put it in our base and that'll come complete the little cup that we're going to use to cast our propellant into. Uh, you can cover the hole in the bottom with masking tape, especially if it's a larger hole, but the hole size that we have right here isn't really going to cause a problem, so we can go ahead and use it as is. Sometimes I'll put a piece of masking tape on the bottom of the casting tube, um, and that does make it a little bit cleaner, but this time I didn't. So we'll just go ahead and start scooping our propellant uh, with a little spoon and filling our casting tube. And this part's kind of tedious, especially with these smaller 38 millimeter motors. Um, this is probably the hardest part and can get kind of messy. The good thing about this propellant being sugar propellant is it cleans up really easily with water and I'll show you that later in the video how easy it is to clean up with water but for now just keep filling your four casting tubes with the propellant up to that line that we made in the casting tube and then once it's full to that line we can start putting in our coring rods. 
And one thing I didn't show here is that I'm constantly stirring the propellant and checking the temperature throughout the process of filling these four casting tubes. Once the casting tubes are full, then you can take them and tap them on the table to level out the propellant. And then I just use a screwdriver here to scrape off the propellant that got on the outside. Um, like I said, this propellant is really easy to clean with water. So whatever you use, you'll be able to just wash off with water so I just had a screwdriver handy so that's what I use. Once you have it cleaned up you can go ahead and put the cap on. Um, these caps are 3D printed as well and they just have a half inch hole in the top and that is to center the coring rod and then they have vents around the outside so that air doesn't get trapped underneath them. So any cap that has a half inch hole centered and a vent, vent holes will work fine. They don't have to be 3D printed like this. Once that cap is on you can go ahead and take your coring rod and just push it down straight to the bottom and the threads on that shoulder bolt should go into the hole that's in the bottom of that base and there's a taper around that hole kind of a countersink to help center that coring rod and that usually works pretty well so there you have it the four casting tubes are full and they have their coring rods in them and then i put a little fan in front of them so that they can cool off quicker and then they just need to cool usually it takes overnight for them to set up you might think once the sugar cools down that they would be set but that's not the case they're still pretty soft up till about 12 to 24 hours is usually the sweet spot for disassembling the casting tubes and getting the final grains out. If you do, try to do it too early then the grains will be too soft and they'll come apart while you try to pull the coring rod out and if you wait too long then the grains will be too brittle and they'll tend to crack. So 12 hours works really well. Anywhere the next day 12 to 24 hours seems to work pretty well. All right and we are back and through the magic of television it's the next day and these have sat overnight about 12 hours. So first we're going to take a rag just a wet rag and clean off the propellant on the outside. Depending on how much propellant there is this can take a little bit of time. I just use a rag and then a squirt bottle of either water or alcohol. If they really have a lot of propellant on them, you can take them to the sink and rinse them off, and that works really well. Just use warm water, and that'll take the propellant right off really quick, and then just dry them with clean, dry rag after you rinse them off, and they'll be fine. So then once you get them cleaned up, then you can go ahead and remove the caps from the two ends. So there you can see I removed the base from the bottom of that one, and then the cap from the top. Just a little twist usually is good enough to get them off. And if there's a little more propellant there, just go ahead and uh, clean that off as well. Here I just use an X-Acto knife to get off the bigger chunks of propellant, and then back to the wet rag to get everything nice and clean. Then once we have everything clean, we can go ahead and remove the core. Um, just a little twisting and stretching. That surgical tubing will stretch, which will release it pretty nicely. On this one, there's some flashing where some of the propellant got under the casting tube, and so you can just remove that with an X-Acto knife. In this case, we have some flashing that got in the core, and so we just remove that with an X-Acto knife, and then there's a little bit of extra propellant past the end of the casting tube that we can remove again with an X-Acto knife. The propellant's still fairly soft after only about 12 hours, and so we can just go in and pretty easily remove it. Just take your time and go around with a sharp X-Acto knife. And this is where if we had put masking tape on the end of the casting tube before we put it in the base, it would have prevented this flashing. So that's typically what I do now, but on this one I hadn't done that. And you can see that the propellant is still fairly soft at this point, so I'm going to put the end caps back on just to keep it round and make sure that it stays round while it fully cures. In another day or so it'll become much stiffer. The last thing I like to do is weigh the final grains when they're done and write on the grain the total weight of propellant that's in that grain, and then the formula I use. In this case, KNSB with 1% RIO is red iron oxide, and then I put the date. That way I know when each grain was produced. And it's a good idea to keep track of the weight of the grain compared to the weight that it should be. If the weight is really low compared to the theoretical weight that it should be, that could indicate that there's a large void in the grain or that there's some bubbles, either of which could cause a major motor malfunction. So here we have a nice shot of our four grains with our hardware that we created in this series. So that's all we have for this video. In the next video of this series, I'll demonstrate how to assemble the motor and we'll test fire it. Hopefully it won't be so long next time.